This episode is brought to you by Where the Dark Corners Are. This podcast is for those who like to travel to dark, creepy places where ghosts roam and ghastly stories were made. It is intended to help you plot and plan your dark journeys to learn about the dank crooks, the curious crannies, and the strange places in the world. You know, where the dark corners are. But also, where the dark corners are explores the world of true crime, true stories, and true evil. Basically, the dark corners of humanity, or rather, the lack thereof. And in between checking out the dark corners of the world and learning about true crime, Where the Dark Corners Are also likes to examine the world of UFOs, Bigfoot, aliens, unsolved mysteries, and many other paranormal curiosities still lurking within our world and beyond our world. So check them out every Thursday, Where the Dark Corners Are. A link will be provided in this episode's description. Friends, your host Billy Dean Shoemate the Third here, and welcome back to another episode of Strange Places. This podcast is brought to you by Asylum Eight Seventeen Productions, Spotify, and Distro Kid. The one hundred and fifth episode of Strange Places isn't that awesome, and I have you to thank. I know I say this a lot, but just the fact that we made it this far when this thing just started off as a silly little experiment. You guys keep coming back, and you really love this show, and you love the subject matter. I do, too. You know, we're, we're rabid about it. I felt like we've uh, developed a little bit of a community here, which is awesome. You guys are the best. So thank you for coming back. Thank you for listening every week and uh, going on these <laughs> journeys with me. I appreciate it. Where are we going this week? The Philippines. We're going to look at the Aswang. Now, before we get into it, I had a lot of trouble pronouncing this word, Uh, but you know, like with my research, I, I dive headfirst into the research. I respect my audience. I respect your intelligence and I do as much research as I possibly can. I know we save a lot for the actual recording of it because I think that's cool. Not a lot of podcasts do that. Save a bunch of the research for when we're actually sitting here recording, get some real Revelations, real reactions. But the Aswang was uh, a lot to unpack, especially with the name. Because I heard Aswang, I heard uh, Aswang, I heard all kinds of things. But after the documentaries that I watched and the books that I rented, and it looks like the people there in the Philippines, they pronounce it Aswang. So that's what we're going to go with. I may be wrong. It may be a regional difference or, you know, something. And there may be some things that are very difficult to pronounce here. So I'm going to try the best I can. I do have listeners in the Philippines. So please don't take any offense to if I pronounce something and completely butcher it. So I, I apologize ahead of time. The idea for this episode was brought to me by a buddy of mine who had, who has been to the Philippines multiple times. And he's married to a Filipino. And I just love their culture, (laughs) the way he describes how they talk and how they do things and how uh, beautifully different their culture is from ours. You're fascinating people, Filipinos. And your history is just, it's it's very rich. Uh, I, I really, I really dig it. So I thought this was a really good one. He said that the legend of the Aswang, it's really peculiar over there because you're always going to meet somebody that swears up and down. They've seen an Aswang, that this thing is real. And unlike mythology anywhere else, really, (laughs) the Aswang's pretty unique from what I've seen, is that it's not necessarily treated as mythology that the vast majority of people in the Philippines, from what I've seen, even the younger people, which surprised me, have a complete and total belief in this creature. The Aswang, it's an umbrella term. And this is, uh, just letting you know, this is based on 
my own personal research, the notes that I've written, the script that I've read. These are my personal observations. From what I gather, it's an umbrella term for various shape-shifting evil creatures in Filipino folklore. If you look at the etymology of Aswang, it literally means evil spirit. Vamp it, it's very familiar, and it harkens back to a lot of mythology that we know well. Vampires, ghouls, witches. There's a offshoot of the, uh, of the Aswang uh, that are known as viscera suckers, transforming human-beast hybrids, usually dogs, cats, pigs. The Aswang is the subject of a wide variety of myths, stories, art, even movies. I watched a movie called Aswang in preparation for this just to see, you know, what an artist would do with this. It came out in 1994, and it's actually a pretty good movie. <laughs> it's an English-speaking film. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I really enjoyed it, actually. It reminded me a lot of John Carpenter's The Thing. It's, uh, this creature is well-known throughout the Philippines. Spanish colonists noted that the Aswang was the most feared among the mythical creatures of the Philippines, even back then in the 16th century. Although with no specific motive other than harming others, their behavior can be interpreted as, uh, I would say, an inversion of traditional Filipino values. The Aswang is especially popular in certain parts of Luzon, some parts of Men Mindanao. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> Capiz, mostly. There's historical accounts of this creature going all the way back, one of the most famous being in 1589 from Friar Juan de Placencia Customs of the Tagalogs. He says in his writings, and I quote, this is from 1589, the sixth was called Siligan, whose office it was, if they saw anyone clothed in white to tear out his liver and eat it, thus causing his death. Now, this gets pretty brutal, so, you know, forewarning. This, like the preceding, was in the island. Let no one, moreover, consider this a fable, because in Calavan, they tore out in this way through the anus all the intestines of a Spanish notary who was buried in Calalaya by Father Fray de Juan de Meridia. The seventh was called Manangnagal. Well, that's a word. This, is, this one's going to be fun. <laughs> and uh, his purpose was to show himself at night to many persons without his head or entrails. In such wise, the devil walked about and carried or pretended to carry his head to different places and in the morning returned it to his body, remaining as before alive. This seems to be a fable, though the natives affirm that they have seen it, because the devil probably caused them so to believe. This occurred. The eighth they called Aswang, which is equivalent to sorcerer or evil spirit. They say they have seen him fly, and then he murdered men and ate their flesh. This was among the islands, among the, Tagal the Tagalos that did exist. Now, that's a quote from Friar Juan de Placencia, 1589. This goes way back, even farther than that. We'll get into that. The term Aswang, it can be thought of as an aggregate term for a multitude of Filipino supernatural creatures. These creatures can be organized into, from what I gather, five major categories that I split them into that parallel creatures from Western traditions all the way as far as Romanian traditions. These go everywhere. These categories are the vampire, the self-segmenting viscera sucker, the were-dog, the witch, and the ghoul. And I'll break these down just a little bit here for you. The vampire needs no introduction. The vampire Oswang disguises itself in the shape of a beautiful woman. It shares its diet of blood with vampires of Western cultures. However, it differs by sucking blood using a proboscis-like tongue, very in in insectoid, rather than you know sharpened teeth. Furthermore, the Aswang do not live in tombs. Some live in forests far from human communities, but the Aswang can infiltrate human society by means of marrying into a community and either slowly draining their husband of blood or else using it strictly as a hideout and leaving at night to raid other villages. Next, we have the Viscera Sucker. It's said to have a diet of internal organs or the phlegmatic discharge of the sick. Like the vampire Aswang, it consumes its food with a proboscis-like tongue, narrow and tubular, you know. 
but not pointed like the vampire. By day, it takes the shape of an attractive, light-skinned, and long-haired woman. Again, woman. By night, it grows wings and segments itself, leaving behind its body from the waist downwards. So it separates itself from the waist. It takes great care to hide its lower half, then flies and searches for victims. It is particularly attracted to fetuses growing inside pregnant women. They're said to live in domiciles deep in the jungle, if not the trees themselves. Next, we have the stories of the were-dog version of the Oswang. This category I named the were-dog, though the creature does not necessarily transform into a dog. What I reason is that the were-creature of a given region is 100% of the time, <laughs> from my research and other things that we've done you know, on this show, 100% of the time I've noticed... The were creature of a given region is named after the most ferocious creature in that area. As such, for example, Europe has its werewolves. India has the were tigers. Africa, yes, has were leopards. I know I was surprised too. And Russia has were bears. The Philippines has no indigenous wolf population, thus making were dog the most appropriate term. Like the previous Oswang. The were-dog infiltrates villages and turns into a creature by night, usually around midnight. The creature is most commonly a dog, but there's also stories of the Oswang being a large cat or a pig. The were-dog then kills and eats people, particularly pregnant women, women again, on the road in the night and don't let their long hair hang loose. Doing so is said to protect against the Oswang. The were-dog is said to develop a taste for human flesh by eating food spat on or licked by another were-dog. Kind of the same as the viscera sucker, right? The were-dog, if you take into account the were-dog version of the Oswang, unlike the previous, they do not infiltrate human communities through marriage, but as a traveler, such as a peddler or a construction laborer in disguise. The witch is the next one. The witch Oswang are characterized by extreme vindictiveness, laying curses upon those who've crossed her by making certain objects like rice, bones, insects come out of bodily orifices of the cursed. Ooh, that's the scariest one. Witches have eyes that reflect images upside down, as well as elongated irises. They live in the outskirts of towns and villages. Witches in the Philippines are feared, avoided, and hated. Witches can become Oswang. Only if they have certain qualities that follow an Oswang already. They can, they, you know, then they can become an Oswang, and by doing so, their powers become stronger, stronger than the other witches as well. If an Oswang is caught, this version anyway, they're to be immediately killed without question. Though, with witches, they're, there's just complete avoidance by the people and people around them. They regard them with fear. So if an incident were to happen near the witch's residence, there is reason to turn to, you know, to turn to the witch and blame and punish. Sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? The ghoul. The ghoul Oswang are described as humanoid, but generally hidden. Their diet consists of human corpses, carrion eaters. Their nails and teeth are sharp and strong to help with the theft and consumption of the corpses. Their diet makes them smell rank and repugnant. They gather in trees near cemeteries and exhume and consume fresh burials. There are outliers. There's other descriptions of the Oswang, but these are the major ones. So there's a lot of similarities here between them, a lot of differences too. But they commonly dwell at night in locations such as cemeteries, woods. Their powers are significantly or sometimes totally reduced during the daytime. Again, sounds very familiar, doesn't it? It's kind of funny, too, because uh, I'm doing this reading challenge right now. It's a self-imposed challenge. It's actually part of my New Year's resolution. I wanted to read a certain number of books this year. And what's kind of funny is I'm reading Dracula by Bram Stoker. It's one of my favorite books ever written. And I'm seeing a lot of similarities here. <laughs> I just think it's funny that I'm currently reading that book right now. There's several reports all over the Philippines of Oswang attacks within large populated towns and cities going all the way to, you know, very remote regional areas. Their apparent ability to adapt and live within the urban and rural environments populated humans while still maintaining their feral, monstrous nature is cited as a feature that distinguishes Oswang from other monsters. 
They also generally have a fear of light, it looks like. Wakes are often brightly lit. Like if you go to a wake in that region, you know, someone passes away, you'll see that they're often really brightly lit, like overdone lit, to ensure that the Oswang would not come to the funeral and steal and devour the corpse. They really believe in this thing. Oswang are traditionally described as one-dimensional monsters and inherently evil by nature with no explicable motives beyond harming and devouring other things. Traditional Oswang have no bias, you know, when selecting their prey, won't hesitate to target even their own. An inversion of the traditional Filipino value of strong kinship and, you know, family closeness, which I'm seeing throughout my research, is a big deal there. They're described to be unclean. They favor raw human meat to the food found in traditional Filipino culture. The Oswang are often described to be lewd in behavior, with female Oswang often exposing their genitals to contrast values of traditional modesty. I don't know if you're developing a picture here, but I am. We'll get into it. There's remedies, several of them, and countermeasures to drive away or slay Oswang. And I'm trying to, I know I'm giving you a bit of an information overload, but I'm hoping that while I'm doing this, things are kind of clicking in your head as far as how far back in history the stories of this thing go, how prevalent they are today, and what it did to shape Filipino culture as it is. There's a dish in Filipino culture called balut. It's basically a... It's a, it's a duck egg with the partially formed fetus inside of it. And, you know, I'm not going to knock other cultures. In India, they think it's, you know, horrific that we eat cows. So I'm not going to knock it. But it's, you know, often seen as something you need kind of a strong stomach, you know, to, <laughs> uh, to consume on a regular basis. And people over in the Philippines, they love this thing. This is a partially formed duck fetus in, still inside the egg, and they eat that. I found one of the countermeasures going way back, way back. We're talking 14th, 15th century here. That preparing an egg in this style was known to ward off the Oswang. And it just became a thing that stuck in their culture. I'm dead serious. Holy objects, spices, salt, ash, the tail of a stingray, large crustaceans, vinegar, Beetle nut chew, urine, they're all used as tools for protection against this thing. Preparing food a certain way, like with the balut. I'm not saying that the Aswang is 100% responsible for balut. I think that would have been a thing anyway, but how it's prepared. I think it's very interesting that there's reports going way back that in order to keep this creature at bay, this is how you should prepare your food. Interesting. They're believed to be the causes of miscarriages countermeasures to drive them away. I mean, they're all over the place. The husband of the childbearing wife, in a lot of cases, remains under the house naked while furiously waving a sword. Yeah, these are, these are traditions. Sharp sticks or bolos, they call them, should be inserted between the bamboos of the house floor to prevent Oswang from lurking under the house. Sick people should not stay in houses with holes. They're told not to groan in order not to attract the Oswang. And these aren't just elderly people saying this, because you would you would suspect that a large majority of the younger, especially in this day and age, you would expect a large majority of the younger people, you know, that myths like this would kind of drop off. And they do all over the world, especially in places you think that they'd be the most prevalent, parts of Germany, Russia, the Romania especially. And it's true. As Things change, <laughs> world-wise, technology-wise. These myths, they still exist, but you find them the most prevalent in the elderly people, not in the Philippines. I'm seeing a huge number of young people. Like every documentary I watch, I mean, even school-age children believe in this thing. The myth is just as prevalent as it was back then, and it's been around for so long, and it stayed strong. That's the thing. It stayed strong for so long that... 
the legend just continues to grow. And the countermeasures against this thing, I was looking at all of them. I mean, <laughs> I'm just getting into a few, just a few. I'm not telling you all of them. This is amazing. There's a certain way to make oil. There's parts of coconuts that could ward it off. Um, picking it at twilight during a full moon when it's wet and gloomy, the breeze should be chilly, the coconut is grated. I mean, even down to food preparation. Scratching noises and home settling is often a sign of a nearby Oswang. Dogs, cats, pigs with no tails are said to be an Oswang in disguise. So there's certain animals that you could put in your area that can help you point out an Oswang. You know, think of the Terminator. <laughs> they use dogs, you know, to point them out. To kill a witch, a bolo knife in the witch's back in a specific area. The bolo must be planted under the ground. Firearms say, there's some traditions that say firearms do the trick. There's some traditions that say firearms do nothing. Magic prayers. While in its helpless state, its body may be cut into pieces. There's just, no, I'm just giving you a few. So if the Oswang is a real creature, it's practically impossible that you're not going to have, if you're you know, part of that culture and living in the Philippines, it's practically impossible that you're not going to be walking around with at least one of these things. Because I see crucifix, I see holy oil, I see that uh, as long as the crucifix is white, they don't care what it's made out of, you could have a piece of paper in your pocket, folded into a cross, you're good. So if I was an Oswang, I'd be shaking in my boots. It's, <laughs> it seems like they'd be prey more than the people, you know what I mean? But we got to go back to the origins of this thing to find out if, this, if there are people in that area that swear that this thing is real. And it's very, it raises an eyebrow for me because a tradition this old, we're talking all the way back, all the way back. This is Filipino folklore. This goes at least the 16th century. Spanish explorers created the first written re record of this thing and that, you know, existed in uh, word of mouth. I mean, for way longer than that. The Aswang was the most feared by native people, even now. One of the most famous origins of the term Aswang came from the tradition of the Bicol region during the 16th century. Listen to this story. This is going to become important in a minute. The original origin story of the Aswang the farthest one that I could possibly trace back, and there's a few, and they vary greatly, but the original, the OG story. The Bicolanos believed in a god named Gugurong. Uh, I, I practiced that before I started recording, and I still got it wrong. <laughs> Gugurong, who was the good god that acted as the benefactor of their region, the defender and guardian of their homes the protector against the evil of the god Aswang. The god Aswang, however, was the evil god and rival who attempted to always cause harm and found pleasure in doing so. Sound like somebody familiar in Western tradition or Middle Eastern tradition? It should. He was always, the good god was always praised. Aswang shunned and cursed. Seems like Aswang wasn't really comfortable with his place in the scheme of things. He kind of wanted to be in charge, it looks like. Again, does that sound familiar? He's portrayed also as a, and I'll give you another story, another origin story too, portrayed as a fire-wielding god who, if displeased with the humans, would cause a nearby mountain to erupt. The Aswang had no control over the people, became jealous of Gugurong's power, the good god. As the Aswang begged for Gugurong's fire, he felt that the Aswang was only trying to have fire to win the favor of the people. He taught people how to use fire. He taught them chemistry, metallurgy, forbidden things that the good God did not want them to know yet. If this sounds familiar, it should. And there's a reason for that. He stole fire and taught it to the people, something very forbidden by the good God, just so this Aswan could cause as much chaos and trouble as he possibly could. This harkens back to stories about Prometheus. This goes back to stories about the Christian Bible tradition of a fallen angel, a guy who said, I, I don't really like the new baby that dad brought home, so I'm going to break all of his toys. You know what I mean? It sounds very similar to that. It causes as much chaos and destruction as possible. Teaching mankind things they were not meant to know. 
at least not yet, disrupting the order. The act brought upon all evils and destruction in the land when Aswang went rogue, which the people have never forgotten the Aswang for, even the younger people in the Philippines. The Aswang is known as, despite all the many different ways of describing this thing and all the many different tales of what this creature does, as varied as they are, the Aswang is universally known as the personification of evil itself. This is mostly associated with the province of Capiz. Am I saying that right? Capiz? Capiz? I'll say Capiz. Which lies on the island. It's in the uh, western region. It's come to be dubbed as the creature's hometown. Now, I watched a documentary. It was filmed in uh, April of 2019. It's called Capuso Mo Jessica Soho. They're allegedly sighted in Himalayan, Negros, uh, Occidental, which lies, you know, the western area, with several residents have been reportedly terrorized by this thing at night. Watch a documentary on this. It was only filmed in 2019. They tried to substantiate the, the, the filmmakers. The residents claimed by installing cameras to capture the alleged creature, but to no avail. It's still prevalent there. For the lens of, I would say, social anthropology, if I could say use that term <laughs> colloquially, <laughs> what inspired the legends of the Oswang can be traced back to two possible sources. The behavior of the wildlife in the region and old school tradition. But what mythological, myth, what mythological creature anywhere else is any different? The thing that really made me want to do this is it's so unusual because this is mythology that obviously has been around for a long time due to its sources and changing and difference. You can go from person, you could go in the Philippines from what I'm gathering and from what I'm watching and reading. You could go to the Philippines right now. You can go up to somebody on the street, ask him about the Aswang, and then you can go to somebody like two feet away or the person standing next to that person and they'll describe an almost completely different creature. Yeah, that's normal. I expect that. But the old people, the young people, everybody, I would say <laughs> eight out of 10 people that you talked to. And the documentary talked about this too. Statistically, they said seven to eight out of 10 people swear that they have seen one themselves or know somebody that has. That's, <laughs> that's amazing. What gets me is the young people. That mythologies like this usually drop as, you know, times change. This creature is very prevalent. Is there something going on here? The folklore of the Aswang has been interpreted as having influenced certain idiosyncrasies of the Filipino people. And see, this is what I'm getting at. Certain behaviors of the modern day Filipinos can be traced back to older, old traditions and customs that were geared towards protecting themselves from the Aswang. And you look back into that. Why do those traditions exist? Where did they come from? Well, the Spanish visitors at the time, this is back in the 1500s, right? They managed to convert the whole of Filipino culture to Christianity. It's a big deal there. See, the Philippines today, they probably boast to be the only Christian nation in all of Asia. Asia. More than 86% of the population is Roman Catholic. That's significant. The pre-Hispanic belief system of Filipinos consisted of a pantheon of gods, spirits, creatures, men that guarded the streams, fields, trees, mountains, forests, houses. Bethala, who created earth and man, was superior to these other gods and spirits. But then they had a visitor. 1565, the arrival of Miguel Lopez de Legazpi. Earlier, beginning in 1350, Islam was spreading northward from Indonesia into Philippine archipelago. By the time the Spanish arrived in the 16th century, Islam was firmly established there. At the time of the Spanish arrival, and I'm getting somewhere with this, okay? Stick with me. The Muslim areas had the biggest and most politically integrated culture, <laughs> probably on earth at the time, probably have unified the entire archipelago. Carrying on their historical tradition of expelling Jewish people from Spain, Legazpi quickly dispersed 
the Muslims. And dominance over the Muslims, you know, it, it, it was achieved rather quickly. It was never achieved totally during the three centuries of Spanish rule. But the Spanish, they did manage to convert the entire area into Christianity. Now, during American rule, yeah, that happened. This is the first half of this century, actually, or the past century, where uh, the Muslims were never totally pacified during the so-called Moro Wars. Since the Filipinos have gained their independence, particularly in the last decade, there's been a resistance by large segments of the Muslim population to national integration. Christianity has just exploded there. Spain conquered and converted the remainder of the islands to Hispanic Christianity. The Spanish seldom had to resort to military force to win over converts, but they couldn't get them all. So, look at history here. Now, a little bit of a disclaimer here. I know we're going to go over on time, but like I said, there's a lot to this. I'm just going to tell it like it is, okay? I'm not bashing anybody. I'm not getting all preachy on you. Nothing like that. This is historical. I'm just letting you know what happened. The Catholic Church... Masses, confessions, baptisms, funerals, marriages. These punctuated, even now, the tedium of everyday routines. You know, this is how you live. This is how they live. The church calendar set the pace and rhythm of daily life. Marketplaces, cockfight pits sprang up near church walls, you know. Gossip and goods were exchanged. It turned into a Christian nation. The results of 400 years of Catholicism were mixed, ranging from a deep theological understanding by the educated elite to a more superficial understanding by the rural and urban masses. Filipino folk Christianity is what they called it. But when the U.S. took over the Philippines in the first half of the century, the justifications of colonizing were to Christianize and democratize. These goals could be achieved only through mass education, right? Most of the teachers who went to the Philippines were Protestants. Did I drive it home yet? Okay. (laughs) So there was a lot of resistance with the way things were. Again, I'm getting into this territory, so I'm not bashing anybody. This is just how it was. Every great religion has its share of blood on its hands, even Christianity. Back when... There was, look at the pagans and the Christians, what was going on back then? Historically, man, we have no idea who started the atrocities in that period. But they were shared across the board. We all have blood on our hands. We all have sordid histories. So with that said, and I'm not hating or bashing on anybody, the only way that the Catholics could really win these people over completely and totally was by incorporating the Aswang. And they did it very systematically. And I'm getting into this because it's going to help explain what's going on here and whether or not this creature is indeed legitimate. They incorporated the Aswang into their conversions. And this was at a time when conversion and Catholicism was kind of a... Uh, It didn't bring about, you know, what you probably see in history books uh, now. I'm talking real history, the stuff they don't tell you in the books. Uh, Conversion and Catholicism in that time period, it's a pretty bloody word, to say the least. But instead of resorting to how it was handled in other areas, they did it kind of smart with the Philippines. I'm not saying it was right, I'm just saying it was smart. Smarter than inquisitioning and, you know, just murdering everybody. They incorporated the Aswang. Don't go to these witch doctors. Don't go to these traditional medicines. You need to go to our learned and educated doctors. Don't go to this person who's going to use this remedy. Don't do that because this is how the Aswang... They incorporated the Aswang into these stories, which is has a lot to do with the major differences and descriptions and tales of this thing. The Catholics used it. We don't know 100%, not 100%, what the Catholics brought to the table. Because the original writings of the Aswang are very old and very sparse. But we we do know that the Catholics used that. 
women in the Philippines, particularly, were very, very powerful. <laughs> they were respected for a time. They were held with reverence. Like I said, not knocking anybody, but back then, uh, with those kind of traditions, those kind of countries trying to convert the Philippines, I was, uh, I was just kind of, <laughs> oh, I don't want to take anybody off here, but I got to tell it like it is, right? We need to be historically accurate. I'm not condoning anything. I'm not bashing anybody. We just got to tell it like it is. Women were a no-no. A woman who looks like this and animals who are unclean that look like this. Oh, it's an Oswang. And they, they knew if they threw that word around that converting these people would be easier. God forgive Christians and Catholics alike for all of their past sins. But they happened. Does that have anything to do with the Oswang being so prevalent in culture today? I think so. But can it explain it completely and totally? The Aswang, it's a vampire, werebeast, cannibalistic human shapeshifter, very much like the skinwalkers in Western culture, right? It's an interesting story, and there's no one particular story to nail down. I know I'm sounding really historical and vague here, but there's no one story to pin down. There's no one documentary to watch. There's no set of photos to look at. There's no singular thing. We don't have an Oswang Roswell somewhere. <laughs> you know what I mean? We don't have an Oswang Tunguska event. We don't have an Oswang Hinterkaifeck farmstead or yeah, anything like that. We don't have an Oswang Amityville. We just have this story. And everybody in that region has a different one. Descriptions all over the place. So... In closing, I'm going to tell you this, okay? You might think I'm crazy for a second, but hear me out. Recite to me the story of Moses, okay? We'll do that together. Let's take a real historical figure. Recite to me the origin story of Moses. Moses was born at a very tumultuous time. He was, him and his, you know, his entire people are, are, are oppressed, are about to be slaughtered, right? So his family packs him away, sends him off where he's found by the family of the Pharaoh who raise him as their own, and he becomes a savior to his people. Recite to me the origin story of Superman. Yeah, Superman. Well, Superman's planet is about to be destroyed, so his parents pack him up, they send him away, where he's found by the Kents, who raise him as their own, and he becomes a savior to the people. The great Stan Lee once said, and I, I believe him, this makes sense to me, that comic books are modern mythology. They are. For that reason I'm sharing, precisely. You could even go further with it. Moses feels an inexplicable need to head to this location where he witnesses an angel who tells him, your people are oppressed and you need to save them. Right? Clark Kent feels this insatiable need, this drive he can't explain to go out into the middle of the Arctic for some reason, where he finds the spirit of his father who guides him and tells him who he really is and that he needs to protect the people of Earth. You see what I'm getting at? Every piece of mythology, every piece of mythology has a kernel of truth to it. That kernel may be microscopic, but every piece of mythology has just a little bit of truth there. There is something true in it. The Aswang, it's going to be impossible to find out what that kernel is, where it is, where it originated, and if it's supernatural or not. But it's still a fascinating story. And it's one that I don't see getting culturally, historically buried anytime soon. The Aswang. Do you have your own story about the Aswang? Filipino listeners, let me know. Any of you out there have Filipino friends or you know spouses or whatever? You have stories about the Aswang? Let me know. I'd be fascinated to hear them. And that's all we got, friends. Special thanks to this week's sponsors who make the show possible. Also, make, uh, make sure to check out the link 
to our Patreon page in this episode's description, where as little as a dollar a month, you can get everything from bonus episodes, ad-free episodes, that's a big one, giveaways of certain tiers, outtakes, bloopers, a podcast just for the patrons. And who does that? Special thanks to the patrons, by the way. The Kunkel Homestead YouTube channel, Kristen Belt, Donald Haynes, Dillagaff. I appreciate you guys. This show would not go <laughs> without you. So thank you very much. Now, are we ever going to run out of strange places to talk about? I don't think so. Because every town has a strange place, and maybe one day, we'll visit yours. Are you ready to experience the future of men's skincare? Look no further than Rival Soaps. They're here to revolutionize the way men care for their skin. They firmly believe that men need smooth, hydrated skin too. It's time to break free from outdated stereotypes and show the world that skin care is for everyone. At Rival Soaps, they understand that quality matters. Their products may not be the cheapest on earth, but you get what you pay for, and that's a clean you can truly feel. Once you try the high quality skincare, there's no going back. They are committed to offering their customers a variety of the latest products, all made from natural and vegan friendly ingredients that are safe for all skin types. The mission is simple, to promote hydrated skin and that irresistibly smooth feel you've always wanted. And it's tailored toward men, ensuring you smell good, feel good, and look great. So why wait? Embrace the Rival Soaps experience today and redefine what it means to care for your skin. Join them in breaking the stigma and let your confidence shine through. Because when you use Rival Soaps, it's not just skincare, it's a statement. A link to their website will be in this episode's description, so check it out. 